Sometimes identifying a single criminal act will lead to many, many other crimes and sometimes dozens of criminals. I'll talk with United States Attorney William Elenfeld II right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Investigation of major criminal conspiracies is a stunningly complex task. My guest is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia, William J. Elenfeld II. Bill, thank you for joining us again. You've been here before. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you, Dan. You, your office has been involved in some cases where you just have dozens and dozens of defendants alleging criminal activity over long periods of time, but they all seem to start relatively simply. You, you identify one event and then it mushrooms. How does this happen? You're right, and whether it's a case involving drug trafficking or firearms or financial violations, uh, it often happens where we identify a relatively minor criminal act. Um, in fact, uh, we recently resolved a case involving uh, a large bank, one of the world's largest banks, uh, but it started with a small town doctor in West Virginia who was committing some Medicare and Medicaid fraud, which isn't a good thing, uh, but it seemed relatively minor. But once our agents and attorneys and investigators began to look at it, they realized there was much more to it than just simple Medicare fraud. And you actually have a, a division within your office that looks at medical crimes types of issues, Medicaid fraud and that sort of thing. We have attorneys and folks in our office who focus in on that issue, yes. And so you became aware of some suspicious activity? We did. Uh, there were health care fraud investigators who looked at some records and realized there was something fishy in regard to a doctor in West Virginia. And they asked us to assist in taking a look at it, and we did. And we realized not only was this physician falsely billing Medicare and Medicaid and a private insurance company for procedures that he wasn't performing. For example, he was billing for an ultrasound that he didn't actually do. Uh, they uncovered this, interviewed patients, used uh, undercover tactics and, and, and had the case made basically, but then they started to follow the money trail and realized that he was laundering the money through bank accounts in West Virginia, uh, throughout the country, to Canada, to the Philippines. Uh, and that caused our investigators to bring in IRS criminal investigators, to bring in agents from FinCEN, which stands for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And they realized it wasn't just a problem with this doctor, it was a problem with the bank. You said laundering money. We hear that term all the time. What, what is that? What does it mean? Basically, it's a way for criminals to try and clean up uh, ill-gotten gains, to try and throw us off the trail, uh, to take money from one account, put it in another account, maybe put it in a shell corporation, and keep moving it around so that maybe we won't figure out that they are ill-gotten gains. In this particular case I'm talking about, we actually went to trial 
on uh, the wife of the doctor because she was involved in the conspiracy. The doctor himself pled guilty, but the wife went to trial, and I, I tried it with one of my assistants. And one of our agents put together a chart that showed all the different directions the money went. And there were arrows all over the place. Uh, and it, it caused your head to spin just looking at it. But that was the doctor and his wife's way of trying to hide the money in such a way that perhaps we wouldn't figure it out. The bank was HSBC. Yes. An international bank. What were they doing that was wrong? Every bank that uh, decides to operate uh, in the United States, which they do, but they also operate internationally. They're perhaps the fifth largest bank in the world. Uh, they fall under rules and regulations of our government. Uh, they have to comply with uh, the Bank Secrecy Act. They have to have an anti-money laundering program in place. Uh, that goes for the bank down the street uh, in, in small town West Virginia to HSBC. They have to have an anti-money laundering program in place. Well, how, do, how does an anti-money laundering program work? What it's supposed to do, if it's being uh, properly implemented and, and enforced by the bank, if there's suspicious activity that's going on at a bank, uh, this program is supposed to create an alert. And then the alert is filed in a system that can be accessed by law enforcement. Well, alerts were being created at, H at HSBC, hundreds and thousands of alerts. But instead of uh, investigating them and reporting them, they were simply clearing them. They were deleting these alerts. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Their, their anti-money laundering program had uh, tremendous deficiencies. And our investigators, and that being our IRS and our FinCEN investigators and assistants in my office, figured this out and that it wasn't just with this doctor, it was uh, a systemic problem throughout HSBC. Uh, a, a U.S. Attorney's Office in Wheeling, West Virginia, which, you know, let's admit, is not the biggest U.S. Attorney's Office in the country. It's one of the smallest. Yeah. Your deputies, your assistants, and your investigators figured out that HSBC was doing it illegally. Yes. It's pretty impressive, Bill. <laughs> it, it is, and uh, I, I'm blessed to have those folks here in our district and in my office to work with because they're the ones who figured it out and then uh, shared it with other agencies. Uh, other districts became involved. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Brooklyn became involved, DEA, ICE, because... Um, ICE is the immigration people. Yes. Um, as it turned out, not only did they have a poor anti-money laundering program, they were also allowing drug cartels to move money uh, from Mexico into our banking system, and they were also allowing other countries uh, to commit illegal acts with their money. So it turned into an enormous case. It, it sounds like the mushroom effect, where you identify one thing and you move that thing or you touch that thing and you find that everything behind it is corroded and, and rotted and corrupt, and you have to, you end up changing a light bulb, you end up replacing the house because the light bulb burned out. Exactly. It, it, it became something much bigger than we ever expected. We're talking about complex, complex criminal cases. My guest is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia, William J. Elenfeld II. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Well, we mentioned yours is not the largest office in the country, U.S. Attorney's office in the country. What kind of resources go into prosecuting a case like this? This particular case uh, involved thousands of hours among, when you, you add it all up from the investigators and the attorneys in my office. Uh, lots of paper, uh, lots of time uh, pouring through documents uh, and working and coordinating with other agencies that, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it, it can really chew up the, the time, uh, the, all the time of an AUSA in my office when you dig into a case like this. I have visions of, of some poor soul at a table with papers stacked all over the place, a green eye shade, with bloodshot eyes hunkered over working these things, and it's not literally like that, but there is a lot of paper, there is a lot of minutia that one has to go through to prosecute these cases. Absolutely. Michael Stein is one of the assistants who worked on this HSBC case, and I've been in his office a number of times since I came on, and, and there's paper everywhere. Now, he knows what it is and, and, and how it's organized, but you're exactly right. He had to spend uh, an enormous amount of time working with the agents and on his own going through all that paperwork to try to figure this out. And that's just 
in your office because once you scratch this scab, once you find out what's going on, entities, you said Brooklyn's uh, United States Attorney's Office, but entities all over the country and I guess in some part internationally got involved in this. They did. Uh, the Brooklyn U.S. Attorney's Office, the asset for forfeiture and money laundering section of the Department of Justice became heavily involved. Attorneys from that office had to travel to Great Britain where HSBC is headquartered to conduct uh, part of the investigation over there and so it, it, it really grew and grew until it was ultimately resolved um, here in early December. And all because uh, a doctor was billing for things that he wasn't doing. That's how we got started with it, yes. Well, this is not the only complex or I'm going I'm to call it a big case. Now, that, that's a subjective term, and if you're a defendant in a criminal case, that's the biggest case in the world is your case. But you've had a lot of cases in your office where you have literally dozens of defendants uh, and that involve actions over months and sometimes years. What, where do you see most of these big type cases? Normally it involves drug trafficking um, or uh, drug and gun trafficking. We've had a pretty busy 2012. Uh, the, the folks in my office have, have worked tirelessly uh, with agents uh, to put these cases together. But uh, it's earlier this year uh, in Marion County we had one of the largest investigations that's ever been uh, put together in the Northern District and 53 people were indicted as a result of, of drug and gun trafficking and it was an operation that was supported by ATF and the Fairmont Police Department. ATF is alcohol, tobacco and firearms. Yes sir and uh, <coughs> hundreds if not thousands of hours invested into that case a lot of uh, money has to be invested in a case like that from the, the, the law enforcement side to get this up and running. Uh, a lot of manpower has to be invested and so it took a lot of cooperation. Uh, in the end it took lots of guns off the street, lots of drugs off the street and a lot of violent criminals were convicted. There were there, And there were criminals at all stages in this from relatively small time purchasers and dealers up to the big dogs that bring it in. You're right. There were some what we might call career criminals, folks that had been through the system before that had prior violent felonies all the way down to the other end with folks who had minimal criminal histories uh, who weren't um, the, the big dogs who we were really going after but they got caught up in in the uh, investigation as well. I, th I think one of the important things that comes out of that case is there are a lot of people who think, well, I'm not a big time drug dealer. I'm just buying a little bit for my own use and passing it on to my friends. Passing it on to my friends makes you a drug dealer. Correct. And you had a bunch of folks like that that were involved in this, a bunch of folks who were just buying it for themselves and maybe trading it for other things. As, as I reviewed that case, there were people who were buying television sets with cocaine. Mm -hmm. or crack or whatever they happen to have. So it, it was everybody, the weekend recreational drug user, if we can call it that, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the, the people who are bringing it in, in in suitcases and pickup trucks. Exactly. It was a wide range of folks and um, you can't just say, well, I'm just uh, giving it to my friends. A lot of times what we see people are selling in small quantities to support their own habit, but Again, that's against the law and, and that's something that we can't uh, turn a blind eye to. We have to investigate and prosecute those folks as well. And those kinds of prosecutions oftentimes lead up the, up the chain to the bigger dealers. In fact, you kind of depend on that. We do. Uh, when we see someone who is small time, who uh, isn't dealing in large quantities, but can open the door to uh, a bigger dealer, oftentimes we'll work with that person to see if they can help themselves out and also help uh, the investigation be further along. How do they help themselves out? What, what do you mean by that? Uh, if, if somebody gets caught up, uh, perhaps a controlled buy has been made and they're confronted with that information, oftentimes uh, they're given the opportunity to cooperate and to make controlled buys themselves from the bigger dealers. And by doing that, they can reduce their exposure. They can reduce the amount of time that they might receive when they get to court. Ultimately, it's up to the judge. And, and no one can speak for the judge. The judge is going to make that decision. But the U.S. Attorney's Office can make a recommendation uh, and an agency can make a recommendation, but that someone be giving, given a little bit of leniency because they were so cooperative. And you have to recommend that. The, the defendant 
has to provide you with useful information, maybe going out onto the streets and buying drugs, which is an incredibly dangerous activity, which is why they get some special consideration and get a, a somewhat lesser sentence. Sometimes not a greatly lesser sentence, but they get some help. Yes, it depends upon the level of cooperation, uh, the amount of good that they do, and then you're right. Uh, my office, uh, and I, I have to look at all of those, the, the motions are presented to me by my assistants, and then we talk about it and say, well, how much do we want to recommend uh, this person get? How many levels of a reduction should they get on the sentencing guidelines? Uh, and then we present that to the court. Yeah, the sentencing guidelines are an interesting thing. We've talked about them here before. Basically, federal sentencing guidelines uh, is a table, uh, they're determined by some sort of formula that recommends to the judge what the sentence ought to be in a case. And it looks at the amount of criminal activity that has occurred in drug cases, it's the volume of the drugs generally, the nature and, and the amount, uh, and the history of the person who did it. If this is the first time a person's been involved in a criminal case, they are dealt with less harshly than someone who's been in trouble with any kind of court in a criminal matter a half a dozen times or even two times. It, it becomes harsher over time. That's correct. Up to the point where you can go away forever. You were talking about controlled buys. What's a controlled buy? Uh, a controlled buy is something that uh, is done with typically a drug task force where they will monitor uh, through sometimes video surveillance, sometimes audio surveillance, uh, a drug transaction from a confidential informant or a CI uh, to someone who's a target of an investigation. And it's controlled in that they're watching it, they're listening to it, they've provided the funds that are going to be used to make the purchase, they've uh, copied the funds that are gonna be used so that they can track those as well. Who copied the bills. Exactly, so that uh, if later on the, the person that uh, they, they do the transaction with is arrested or a search is done, they can confirm whether or not it's the same money. Uh, and they, uh, afterwards, you know, b beforehand, they, um, they pat the person down, make sure they don't have any contraband on them, and then afterwards, they do the same thing. They take the, the drugs that were purchased and debrief the person, and so all parts of it are controlled, uh, and uh, oftentimes <coughs> it makes for strong evidence in a criminal case. We're talking about complex criminal cases. My guest is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia, William J. Elenfeld II. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. Strong evidence. <laughs> as, as someone who does criminal defense work in the federal system from time to time, uh, I have had many cases where the evidence is disclosed to me and I'll, I'll get a stack of DVDs with video on them or CDs with audio recordings and, and documents. And I see in these recordings my client handing over drugs, taking money, driving off, arriving, talking about how much more he or she can get and where it came from and that sort of thing. There's not much a criminal defense attorney can do when evidence like that is, is uh, dropped onto their desk. That's pretty good evidence, what you just described there. And, and the best thing a defense attorney can do is to try and argue for uh, something at sentencing that uh, is less than what the guidelines might normally call for. Maybe there's, there's some special circumstances, but it's tough in a situation like that. Yeah, the best thing you can do is just be frank with your client and say, here's what it is, look at these films, listen to these audio recordings, who is that? And I've, I've had some brave souls say, well, that's not me, I don't have a gold tooth, <laughs> but mm -hmm. the guy in the recording does. <laughs> you know, there are ways to explain that. And usually you have to explain to them, here are the people who are going to be on the jury, if, if we have a trial in this case, what do you think they're going to say? And mm -hmm. Most typically, they understand that there's a problem. Because these things, federal criminal prosecutions, for drugs at least, are not questions of did you intend to commit a crime here or can you characterize it some other way. Uh, nor is it a question of were you stealing a loaf of bread to feed your hungry children. These are drug cases. These are taken very, obviously taken very seriously by your office. They are, and it's something that we do on a very regular basis. We prosecute probably more drug crimes than any other type of crime in our district. In fact, I, I reviewed uh, the United States Sentencing Commission, which is the federal entity that keeps track of uh, sentences in criminal case, federal criminal cases, how they're resolved, who's involved in them. And nationally, about 35% of all the crimes in the United States are drug-related crimes. 
and, and I'm not surprised to hear that. Uh, that percentage might be higher in our district, but uh, we also have a, a large number of gun crimes that we prosecute, white collar crimes that we prosecute, health care fraud, but drugs would be at the top of the list. What kind of gun crimes? Uh, felons in possession. Uh, and and there's, there's a list of folks who are prohibited from possessing guns. The, the, the most popular or the most common is a felon who's no longer allowed to possess a gun, but there are other types of people who can't possess a gun. Uh, a drug user or a drug addict is not allowed to possess a gun. Um, in, in fact, and that, that's the point we ought to make, if you use drugs, if you use them and can be fairly described as being a chronic drug user or an addict, addict you can't own or possess a gun. You can't live in a house where a gun is present because if you do, that in and of itself is a federal crime. And that might be the one portion of that statute that most people are surprised by. They don't realize that that's the case. But uh, if you're subject to a family violence protective order, you can't possess a firearm. If you're under indictment but not convicted, there's a, a prohibition there. If you've got a domestic battery conviction, there's a prohibition there. And there's a, a list of others as well. So uh, we, we prosecute cases like that. We also prosecute gun trafficking, where uh, folks are selling stolen firearms or, uh, or trafficking in, in firearms in other ways that are illegal. Let's go back to the drug issue. What is the most abused drug that you're seeing in West Virginia right now? We're seeing the most, uh, the biggest problem with prescription pills, with painkillers, uh, but it's tied in closely to heroin. Uh, typically, folks who begin using uh, painkillers can no longer afford to use the painkillers and they'll switch over to heroin. So those kind of go hand in hand. They have similar effects. Uh, they come from the same family. Um, so we see lots of pills and lots of pills coming in from cities nearby West Virginia. You've had some huge prosecutions we have. Uh, we recently indicted close to 30 people in the Wheeling, West Virginia area who were bringing in pills and heroin from Baltimore, Detroit, and Columbus. And so uh, big cities, but they're really not that far from here. It's a short drive uh, for folks from West Virginia to go there, pick up a, a load of pills, maybe do some doctor shopping, and bring them back to West Virginia to be delivered here. What's doctor shopping? Uh, that's when somebody goes from doctor to doctor to doctor claiming that they have some type of a malady, some type of an injury, maybe a back injury or a neck injury, uh, and trying to find a doctor who's going to write them scripts and not really be concerned uh, about whether or not they have a serious medical problem. Most of these injuries, I'm going to put quotes around the, the word injuries, are soft tissue injuries where the doctor looks at it, can't really see anything, presses something and says, does that hurt? And in many of these places, if the person says yes, that's all the doctor wants to hear, and he or she will write a prescription for these drugs and maybe just sell them out of their own practice. I, I've seen that happen from time to time. We see that, exactly what you described, and we also see uh, MRIs that uh, have been, um, they're, they're not accurate. They've been manipulated somehow to show that someone has an injury to their back or their neck when they really don't, and then that person can take that MRI and take it to a doctor and say, see, this is, this is my problem when it really isn't. We, we seem to be criticizing doctors a lot. <laughs> yeah. Is it widespread within the medical community or is it just a few rogues? I'd like to think it's just a few rogues. I'd like to think that most of the doctors, at least in northern West Virginia, are, are good people that want to do things the right way. I, I, I have friends who are physicians who say uh, how cautious they are in this day and age with writing prescriptions for painkillers and, and how they, they don't like to do it, even though it's a very important part of medical care and, and people uh, need them and use them for legitimate purposes. Well, and like you, I represent a fair number of physicians too, and their biggest concern is if I have a patient who really needs to have this kind of medication, but they're having a lot of it, I don't know if I can continue it or how I can change to other things. And the patients can be quite insistent, uh, even the ones who legitimately need these things, that they need them just to function normally. And I've heard the same thing. Uh, we've had to indict doctors uh, here in the Northern District who have um, been prescribing pain medication for non-legitimate medical purposes. We've indicted doctors who are from other states, but they're prescribing for folks who are bringing them back to West Virginia. So it's just something we have to keep our eyes on and, and, and we hope that we don't see a lot of it with doctors here.
Well, and there's so many other things that we could talk about that we're just not going to have time to talk about today. Synthetic drugs, uh, these things are fascinating, uh, things of that sort. In fact, it seems to me that all drugs are synthetic. <laughs> Heroin was synth synthesized. The oxy drugs uh, were all synthesized. But I, I hope you'll have an opportunity to come back and, and talk again uh, later on about some of the things that are going on in your office and as things change and develop. Uh, we've done other programs here in the past where we find that there are a lot of people who are confused about how serious some of these drugs are, and you've kind of got your finger on the pulse. I'd love to come back. Thank you. William Elenfeld II, uh, United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia. Bill, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Dan. Thank you also for being with us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. On The Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Additional support for the law works is provided by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.